Production funding for Behind the Headlines is made possible in part by... DHG is a full-service accounting firm serving Memphis and the Mid-South region for more than 60 years, combining community involvement with the technical resources of a national firm. For more information, visit dhgllp.com. The WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. David Stevens on the Bartlett City Schools, tonight on Behind the Headlines. I'm Eric Barnes, publisher of the Memphis Daily News. Thanks for joining us. I'm joined tonight by David Stevens, superintendent of the Bartlett City Schools. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me, Eric. And Bill Drees, senior reporter with the Memphis Daily News. So you have finished uh, your first year. Um, I'll start with the most basic question. How did it go? Well, you know, when, when we started this, it, it was we have been in a couple years of turmoil as we went through the merger, and I was part of that, and then the demerger. Uh, if people would have said that, you know, after one year, this is what you're gonna, where you're gonna be. Uh, I would have signed up day one. I mean, things went 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 great. I mean, I think we learned so many lessons through that merger uh, that there were issues that we knew that had to be addressed because nothing had happened on that scale in in in, in the United States. So, um, you know, I think there were a lot of lessons learned. So we were. It really helped as we started putting these municipal school districts together and make sure that we get everything taken care of. It's been interesting for me. I mean, we covered it, you know, a lot. I mean, to the point that when that de merger and demerger, the point was, you know, people would see me in the grocery store and say, stop talking about the schools. I know it's important. But but one thing that's been interesting this year, we've, this summer, we've tried to have all the superintendents on from the, the various suburban schools. I'm really fascinated by the fact that it, it's not, it didn't go back to the status quo. You're now an independent school district, right. and not all of them are the same. I'm even looking at, I don't live in Bartlett, so I, I lost track of this. There are right. 11 schools. It's a $71 million budget. Right. It's a, really a very large suburb. It may be a small compared to Memphis, but it's a very right. large school system. Well, if you look at the city of Bartlett, I believe Bartlett is the 10th largest city in the state, and uh, we're probably in the top 20, 25 school districts in the state size-wise. So, yeah, it is a... It is a, we are, you know, the largest of the municipalities, uh, and, uh, you know, it is, it's a very, uh, it's complicated, it's complicated work, getting everything started from scratch, uh, you know, it took a lot of man hours and a lot of effort, but, you know, it's amazing when you have a team of committed people uh, that, that wanted to make it happen, it, it was really exciting to, to see that and be a part of that. Right, Bill. So, as we go into the second school year for Bartlett City Schools, um, what, what, happens differently and, and and what do you build on from this first year? Well, you know, I think the thing we've been, I've been talking to my faculty, my community, to everybody, there's four things that we got to have to have a great school system and that's our foundation. And first it starts off with great teachers. You know, the number one thing that impacts student achievement are great teachers in the classroom. So we really feel that we've been able to retain many of those teachers um, from, from the, the legacy Shelby system and to be able to bring in some new quality folks. Also, we have to have great leadership in the buildings. We have a very seasoned group of principals and that's so important to have that leadership. Next, you have to have a supportive district office and one of the things where, you know, it's the, a different paradigm shift for us because, you know, we are not this large district. It's a very small, fairly lean central office so many people wear many different hats. And then that engaged community. So that's kind of been our basis, what we've done. One of the things we're really looking at is how do we build on that? And one of the areas that we're really focusing on is technology. Uh, one of the things we did last year, we created a ninth grade academy at the Chatelon Middle School. We were in a, in a kind of a unique position where we retained all the buildings, but we did not retain all the students. Uh, so we have open enrollment policy, but we looked up and we had four middle schools, but we really needed capacity or, or students for three. Uh, but we knew our high school was going to be, in the next couple of years, very crowded. Uh, so this coming year, we're going to have 700 ninth graders in the, in the academy. So we did a pilot uh, with technology with students last year. Now we're going to take that technology, and every student, 6th, 7th, 8th, and ninth grade, will have a laptop. Uh, so we're rolling that out. That's been a great partnership with the city of Bartlett, uh, with our board and with our district staff, looking at how we can take uh, existing funds, for example, math textbooks, uh, you know, we have new assessments coming out. Uh, these textbooks are, are, you know, they're, they're fairly static. What you get in the textbook is in there. There's so many open source 
opportunities so we're looking at reappropriating those dollars to put technology in the hands of our kids so we're excited about that we think that is something that's going to help us and then to continue to build on that foundation of great teachers great leaders supportive staff and engaged community mm -hmm. I, I about a year ago at this time i was i was at your ninth grade academy as as it was getting set up and i, I walked in knowing that you had some of the some of the space concerns and that that was one of the motivations behind the ninth grade academy but there was also another motivation behind it and that was a better transition out of middle school into high schools so whatever the 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 discussion winds up being about space the ninth grade academy looks like it's it's there to stay it is and, and one of the things when we first started this you know we would never do anything based just on space. It has to have educational value. Uh, so when we looked at this, when I was the vice principal at Millington High School, we started a ninth grade academy at that school uh, in the old elementary school. So I'd had experience with that and back in that day we had gone to other, uh, we went to Henry County, they have the Grove School which is a separate ninth grade academy away from the campus. So I had that frame of reference and I saw how that worked. Now we had to take it and make it work for Bartlett. The interesting thing was, you know, communities don't like change. Uh, so there were a lot of people that were saying, you know, they wanted their kids to go to the high school and, you know, the, the interesting thing, I have a daughter that will be a ninth grader in the academy and this time last year she was like, Dad, I don't think this is a good idea. Now she is excited. She's excited because the, the returns are, are out that, that this was great. It was great to get the kids as a cohort of students. Uh, the teachers tell me that it's like working at a small private school. You know, you have just this one group of kids fairly homogeneous group of kids. They're all ninth graders. They're dealing with the same issues. Uh, so we're able to give them a great foundation um, and to get them ready for that uh, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade years. So. And let's go through, just for people who aren't familiar with the Bartlett School System, and again, it is bigger than, you know, than, than, I, than I tend to group all these different suburban school systems together, but there are how many um, uh, elementary schools? Six elementary schools. All right, and what we, put, we can put these on the, on the screen as we, um, as we talk about this. And then how many middle schools? We have three middle schools. Okay, and one of those, which one of those? We, is then the we have a ninth grade academy. Then the ninth grade academy. That was okay. the fourth middle school that we repurposed, and then we have Bartlett High School. In the Bartlett High School, and uh, right. when we've had, you know, obviously in Collierville right now, in Lakeland, some of these other schools, there's big conversations about um, growth, Germantown. Um, adding schools, I mean, a $100 million high school, $99 million high school in Collierville and so on. Where are you in terms of that? Is that on the horizon? Well, Is that coming up for you well, that you I, need you know, to start building schools? We've done our five-year capital plan, and, and when we look at the space, one of the advantages in the old Shelby County system, they built elementary schools to hold about 1,000 students. Um, and as I said earlier, you know, when we kept all 11 buildings, but, for example, Bartlett Elementary, is right on the western border of the city limits of Bartlett. Right across the street, we have 400 students that live in Shelby County that walk on an open enrollment transfer to Bartlett Elementary. Mm -hmm. That just made sense. We do not need empty school buildings. These kids identify with that community, identify with the school. So that's been great. You know, the, the area, with, with by putting in the academy, we have been able to push this down the road because we're looking in about three or four years, we will have 3,000 students 9 through 12. As you can see, we're having 700 freshmen this year. Uh, so down the road, does it mean at the Bartlett campus that we're going to have to do some renovations or maybe adding some buildings down in the future? <clears throat> that we'll see. But in, for, the, for the near future and what we can see for the next three, four, five years, uh, we're going to have the capacity. And that, that's an advantage that I think that we have in Bartlett um, over some of the other... And does that give you some time to, and I don't want to say learn from mistakes, but learn from, from how the other communities, I mean, you know all the other superintendents, sure. and, the, and you know, no one wants to pay more taxes, and no one wants to, but everyone wants good schools. I mean, there's sort of these classic debates that go on, so do you kind of watch out of the corner of your, I mean, I know you're focused on Bartlett, but you must well, look out of the corner of your eye, and how's it going in Collierville? How's it going in Germantown? Yeah, it, what can I learn if I'm going to have to face this three, four well, years sure. down the road? Sure, you know, I think all of us look at, at what's happening in the other districts, and we, you know, I, I, I'm still talking talk to the other superintendents. I still, uh, you know, I got a text from Dorsey yesterday. He and I still, we stay in touch, you know. Uh, so we're always watching what everybody does because the bottom line is we want to see all of these school systems do well. We yeah. want to see Shelby County Schools do well, Collierville, Bartlett. But it does give us a little bit of an advantage that we do not have to jump into this day sure. one so we can kind of look back and see. Now, my colleagues were all, you know, saying, man, I'm glad that you're creating a ninth grade academy and not me this during the first year. You know, that was kind of something right. that we had to do that, that you know, sure. that we had to get it right. And, and fortunately, so far, we've gotten that right. Right, Bill. Um, so uh, 
This week was, was TCAP week. Uh, achievement test results uh, uh, across the state went out to the individual school districts, and the numbers were good for Bartlett. They were they, they showed growth uh, in in the three areas for the for the elementary and middle school students. Um, so so talk a little bit about about what what those tests tell you about how things went this first year. Well, we, we're, we're pleased. You know, is is we we think that we have really good results. We know we have really good schools and really good teachers. Um, you know. There's other areas that we need to improve, sure, every, every school district in this country. But we are very pleased that we're showing growth in every area. Uh, you know, the thing that I think what really helps with the municipal districts is I tell my, my principals, you know, especially at the high school, for example, and we had some double-digit growth in Algebra one and Algebra two, um, And I tell the principal there, I said, you know, it's kind of the blessing and the curse. You have a superintendent, a school board, and a community that is focused in and a district staff on one high school. You know, luckily my offices are there on one end of that building in, a, in an old uh, part of the old elementary school that was moved over into the high school. So, I, you know, I can daily be in touch with my principals. I can, I can hit every school in the district in a day. Uh, so I think it's that, that local control and being able to focus in and really find out what are the issues at the school and how can we come up with a prescription to address those. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think being there to help support. So I think that is the one thing that I've seen. I know when in the legacy Shelby County, we had 51 or 52 schools, uh, you know, 50,000 students. When we merged, when I was the deputy superintendent with Superintendent Hobson, you know, 240 some odd schools and 100, and, you know, it was, it was, there was such a divide. And there's always a divide between the district office, the superintendent's office and the school. But with these smaller districts, we're able to close that divide and be able to give a little bit more hands-on um, um, uh, 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 approach to, to education and be able to support them and really look at what are their needs and how can we leverage the support to meet those needs. In, in terms of the TCAP scores, they're, 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 there's this pretty obvious scenario of, of the effort that needs to take place when you have maybe uh, 30 to 40 percent of the students who are proficient or advanced in math or science or, or in reading. But there, there's a different kind of challenge, and it is a challenge to continue growth when 75% of your students are proficient or advanced. T t talk about yeah, that. Yeah, I think that is the, the issue, you know, because once you, you know, is there a ceiling or is it a glass ceiling? And, you know, we try to look at it as a glass ceiling. We always feel our students can, can improve. And that's one of the things when you look at the state assessment model, there's multiple measures there. You know, you just have the straight achievement, but then there's the value added. Mm -hmm. You know, how well did the students do based on previous um, test scores and previous performance? So I think when you take all of those multiple measures and you put that together, it gives you a, a, a good idea of are you growing students? Because at the end of the day, that's what we want to see. We want to see every year our students improve. And the bottom line is we want to get as many students proficient or advanced. One thing, Bill, I will say, I think back when, when you look at the definition of proficiency, uh, it changed back with the, with the onset of the Tennessee Diploma Project. Sure. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, back when, you know, when I was in school, I remember if you made a 98 on a test and I made a 70, uh, we both passed. But we knew there was a great difference between my performance and your performance. So what the state did, and I think this was really smart, if you are proficient, you are proficient. I mean, the correlation I would give is you're, you're at a very, very high C to a B. You know, you're, you're doing well. You are proficient. So, uh, and that's the goal. We want our students, when they walk out of Bartlett High School, to be proficient in all areas so they're ready for college or career and what their future holds. So uh, across the school systems, l literacy proficiency, it, it always seems to lag, or, or, or at least under these standards, la lags behind science and, and, and math. What's, what's the key to that? Ha, has anyone found that uh, uh, to, to bring those numbers up? Or is it a matter of math and science come first and then <clears throat> literacy? Well, I think one of the things we've, we've been doing in the state, there's been a lot of discussion as we move towards different and new standards and now Tennessee standards. There was a lot of emphasis and, and concern with, we were doing okay in reading, but our math scores were so low, so it's, it's kind of like you know, that, that game whack-a-mole, where mm -hmm. you have an issue, where you go hit that one, well then you look over, there's another. Uh, so I think what we had done in the state had really given us a lot of support. 
of reinforcement around math skills because we, we had seen that our math scores were really struggling. So that focus has been there. Maybe some of that focus has come off of the reading. I believe before students can be good at math, they have to be good at reading. I mean, reading is that fundamental skill. Uh, you know, I was pleased in Bartlett that we were one of the few state, uh, districts across the state that we did show some growth in three through eight reading. Uh, but it is difficult. It's, it's, it's not the amount of growth that we want to see. But I think as we move towards this new TN Ready, the new assessment, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, the, and now that our standards, our curriculum, and our assessment is going to all be aligned, I think that's one of the issues that we've had. There was some misalignment with what standards we were teaching and what the assessment was on. Next year, those things are going to be aligned. But I really think, though, with this new assessment, we kind of can throw all this out the window because I think the, the, the rigor of this assessment is going to be something that... And, and it, for you, and you were in Nashville recently with some, most of the other local superintendents, I mean, is there a sense that you have to go to the legislature, to go to the governor, the director, the Department of Education, and say, stop? <laughs> just, okay, let's well, just live with these standards and these assessments. They, they, nothing is perfect, but, because that's an interesting thing to watch, is the shifting ground. You've got Common Core, and then suddenly you don't have Common Core, and you've got all these things, and you've got TCAP, but it's out of alignment with this. Do you just need some breathing room it, to have some consistency across the, the assessment and the, the curriculum and so on, and not the constant change right. from Nashville. And, and it, was, it was very encouraging when we sat down with the, the folks in the, uh, the House Education Committees, subcommittees on education, and one of the representatives, and, and they all agreed with this, said, we need to let the reforms that Tennessee has been undertaking take root. We need to, to let this, we need to let things settle down yeah. and do that. And I think we're at that point now. I think that with, as we look at the standards, with the new Tennessee standards that are being developed, they're going to work and fit for the students in Tennessee, the aligned assessment. I really think that the folks in Nashville realize that we have had a lot of change and we do need to get at some semblance of equilibrium so we can see right. how this works. Because, and I remember talking to people through the merger and demerger and so on, and they would talk about certain changes and that's all a part of consolidation. And I would say, well, no, actually, that's entirely different. That's no child left behind, or that's the exemption to no child, or the exception to no child left behind, right. or that's the, you know, I mean, there was so much change from every possible front. It is interesting that you've, like you said, you know, getting through that first year and you're, you're probably better shape than you thought you were, given how much change. I mean, they right. talk about Memphis being teacher town. They talk about all, you know, charter schools. Obviously, there right. aren't charter schools in, in, in Bartlett, but still, the amount of change that has come through Tennessee education and this area specifically is remarkable. Yeah, yeah. I think we have been at the, the center of the country looking at what is happening in Tennessee. Right. You know, being the first state to get the race to the top funds, then you had this merger and then you have, you know, if you look at in, in, in the boundaries of Shelby County, the opportunities that parents have for their students. Yeah. You know, you have six municipal districts, you have the Shelby County District, you have how many charters yeah. Um, you know, private parochial. So it's it's really a, a, a great thing, I think, one, for parents to be able to have that, that, you know, when people talk about vouchers and those things, I don't really see the need for vouchers in Shelby County because Well, isn't you open enrollment choice. a form we of have a, a right. voucher that program? Is. We yeah. have, and every one of the municipal districts right. have that open enrollment. How many, out, out, just some factual question, how many out, outside open enrollment students do you yeah, have? Yeah, we're, we're looking at this, this year having 8,700 students, and it's probably going to be about 1,700 open enrollment students, yeah. right. And, and in, uh, in terms of that competition, so you're, you're in competition sure. for the students, and, the, and as, you know, we say the state money travels with the kid and so on, but are you in competition for teachers as well? Well, sure. I mean, I think that's the thing. You, you, as I went back to my foundations, the first thing I said is you have to have great teachers. Yeah. And all of us are looking, trying to pull that. And I think as far as from that teacher town uh, label that, that's, that we're looking at here, I think it's a great opportunity. You know, if somebody from outside is looking to come and teach and really have an impact on students' lives. This is a, I mean, Shelby County is a great place to be. Yeah, yeah. Bill. So in, in terms of your students who, who live in Bartlett, um, how many were, were going to these schools before the demerger and, and how many are there after? Is it fairly static? Or? Yeah, it's, it's, well, I think if you look at some of our, if you look at where the schools are laid out, it's, it, they were not laid out for a municipal district. They were laid out for a, a county district. So, you know, we have a couple of border schools that are on the, the border of the city. So they were drawing a lot of kids from outside, a couple of our elementaries. So there's been some changes there. You know, we did a little bit last year, a little bit of redistricting uh, to try to level that out. Um, 
But, you know, with the open enrollment and with the, the size of our schools, of being able to have, you know, in an elementary school, schools built for 1,000 students, you know, we're able to uh, get those students and, and give them that opportunity because, you know, so many of these students had been attending the schools historically. So as we looked at that, we wanted to, as we looked at the Bartlett residents and then we looked at students that were attending the Bartlett schools to give them that opportunity. Mm -hmm. What, what, have you had a chance in all of this in building a school system from the ground up? Uh, have, have, have you had time to uh, kind of look around and see how the Bartlett City school system, its existence, is kind of changing development patterns, housing patterns in yeah, Bartlett. Yeah, as we did our five-year CIP plan, we sat down with a team of folks, and we had folks from the city. Uh, you know, and there's a couple of things I think that are helping us. The economy is recovering. The housing market is, is bouncing back. But we're seeing more, more, more housing starts in the Bartlett area, and more people talking to the city folks or developers and folks are talking about this track of land or looking at this and seeing about those early stages of, of that development because I think that, uh, you know, the, the thing people, when people move to a community, the two things they want to know is one, how safe is the community and then two, what kind of schools do you have? And I think it's something that we are really committed to having as good of schools as there are in this state. You know, we want to have very strong schools because we want every every student that comes into our buildings to have that opportunity. So mm -hmm. I think it's important. Mm -hmm. when, when, uh, one thing I should have followed up on when kids, because some of the school, some of the other school systems, the, the money travels with the kid when they come from out of district, but they, the parents end up paying, making up some of the difference. Does Bartlett do that? Too? Well, I think if, if a student comes outside of Shelby County, okay, it would be the local portion okay. of that they would make up. So if a student lived in Tipton County or Fayette County, right. right. Then we would we would have them make up the local portion, uh, and but but it's out that it's outside the county. Right, That's if you are in the county, if you are in Shelby County, the the, the thought right. is that you're paying those taxes. You're yeah, you're there, sure. so you can come, and there's no charge. Right. So. Speaking of taxes in, in the county, um, just recently the tax collections for Shelby County came in better, twenty two million dollars. That's a lot of money, particularly you know when we have years of, of really tight budgets at the county level and so on, and coming off the recession. Um, I assume you'd love for some of that $22 million to go to schools and some of that 22, that money that goes to schools to sure. make its way to Bartlett. Sure. I mean, that, that's an important part and part. You know, the, the thing you look at, if you look back when the, when, when the recession hit and the economy went flat, you know, so much of our funding comes from those county property taxes. And property taxes were depressed, so we were getting pretty much flat funding for so many years. Well, each year you operate. Uh, you know, it, it costs more to operate those school districts. So, you know, anything that from the state, local, that we can get, you know, we try to be great stewards of the of the taxpayers' dollars and make sure that we invest those dollars right. wisely. But, yeah, it's always, funding is always an issue. If you if you look at Tennessee where we are in funding compared to other states, yeah. you know, we have a long way to go. And, so, and what about, you know, some of the other superintendents have talked, I mean, in all the systems, um, have talked about just the deferred maintenance, I mean, on, on buildings. I mean, where do you, how do you feel, what, I mean, What's, do you have a list? I mean, of sure. Yeah, there's. You know, right now we're doing a roofing project at one of our elementary schools, and we've got uh, the 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 county uh, allocated some money to Shelby County to do some some uh, facility studies. So right now, when when they allocated that money, we got our our um, our split of that. So right now, there's two of our older elementary schools that we have architects and engineers going in looking at, seeing what is it going to cost to get these schools up to standards. One of the issues that we had is when the merger started, and I understand where the county commission came from, is they basically said, we're not going to put any CIP money in. You know, we're not going to, we're not going to give the districts, Memphis or Shelby County. So we went through a two or three year period where we weren't getting those capital funds right. to stay on top of that deferred maintenance. So it's kind of like your house. If you don't do anything for three years and then all of a sudden you get a little bit of money, you look back and say, wow, we need to, right. to get on top of that. And, and one of the things in Bartlett is, you know, all we do not have, we're like uh, some of the other districts have newer buildings. You know, Bartlett's been a pretty uh, older community yeah. and buildings have been around for a... Right, right. And you've got a pre-K program? We do. Uh, how many kids? Uh, we have three pre-K classes in, in three different schools. We, we really appreciate Mayor Luttrell and, the, and his work of adding last year another pre-K through that, some of that windfall of the, the, the excess mm -hmm. in the budget. Uh, and we have about 60 kids, and, and it's uh, based on need. And we're part of that consortium with uh, 
I think it's uh, Millington and Bartlett, Metro Nashville and Shelby County that has right. received some grants. But we're monitoring that to see do we need to increase that? What is the need? You know, right now. How much interest has there been? It's, there's, okay, yeah. it's a real big debate in the county it is. nationwide. Yeah, right now. Our three classes right now are full. So, yeah. you know, we're not we don't have this large waiting list. Uh, but, you know, we're yeah. going to look at that and monitor it and see is down the road, does it make sense to add another class as the need may arise? And have you followed it all? We just have a minute left here. It's a, a bigger question we have time for. But the, the, the funding lawsuit that uh, with the BEP formula, the way the state funds, is Bartlett talked about joining in that lawsuit or are you just watching how well, that's going to We're kind of watching right now. You know, yeah. we, we've, we've got, you know, just getting up in our first year and, and still, like I tell our folks, we can't have that sophomore slump. I mean, how many times have you seen that great freshman athlete or someone come out and have a great year and then look there? So we're making sure that we're taking care of the things here, but we are kind of watching that because, you know, any funding that we can receive this additional, you know, there, there are definitely many, many needs out there. All right. There's students, thanks for being here. Bill Drees, thank you. And thank you for joining us. Join us again next week. Good night. DHG is a full-service accounting firm serving Memphis and the Mid-South region for more than 60 years, combining community involvement with the technical resources of a national firm. For more information, visit dhgllp.com.